Have you seen your papers? I don't think I have them on me. In that case, we'd have to ask you to come along. Wait, it's possible that I... Uh, yes. Here we are. These papers expired three weeks ago. You have to come along. Halt! Halt! It is time to wake up, America. These ID cards are not about defeating terrorism, but they are all about controlling the American people. I arranged an interview with Catherine Albrecht, a leading authority on the RFID chip. Her book entitled Spy Chips is the definitive book on this subject. I wanted to find out just how dangerous these chips are to our liberties. RFID is a technology that uses tiny computer chips the size of a grain of sand or even smaller hooked up to miniature antennas to transmit information about items at a distance. Back in 1999, Procter & Gamble, Gillette, and MIT got together to find a way to commercialize this technology and make it small enough, make it efficient enough, and make it low cost enough to essentially their dream is to put one of these tiny uh, computer chips on every physical item manufactured on planet Earth. The latest technology for identifying people at the point of sale, for identifying people when they make purchases, is actually the implantable chip that you can actually embed directly into human flesh. Uh, it's a tiny glass capsule about the size of a grain of rice. It contains an RFID computer chip uh, with a coiled antenna and it can transmit information also at a distance. Homeland Security folks, uh, the Department of Defense and others have uh, expressed an interest in being able to more closely monitor the U.S. populace and one way to do that of course would be being able to determine who buys what and uh, where they take those things. Guaranteed hot in 30 minutes or it's free. This is Mary. May I take your order? Hi, uh, Mary. Yes, I'd like to order. This is Mr. Kelly? Uh, yes. Thank you for calling again, sir. I share your national identification number is 610-204-9998-45-54610. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. I see you live at 736 Montrose Corp, but you're calling from your cell phone. Are you at home? I'm just leaving work, but I'm... Oh, we can deliver to Bob's Auto Supply. That's at 175 Lincoln Avenue, yes? No, I'm on my way home. How do you know all this stuff? We just got wired into the system, sir. Oh, well, I'd like to order a couple of your double meat special pizzas. Sure thing. There'll be a new $20 charge for those, sir. What do you mean? Sir, the system shows me that your medical records indicate that you have high blood pressure and extremely high cholesterol. Luckily, we have a new agreement with your national health care provider that allows us to sell you double meat pies as long as you agree to waive all future claims of liability. What? Do you agree, sir? You can sign the form when we deliver, but there is a charge for processing. The total is $67 even. Sixty-seven dollars? Well, that includes the delivery surcharge of fifteen dollars to cover the added risk to our driver of traveling through an orange zone. I live in an orange zone? Now you do. Looks like there was another robbery on Montrose yesterday. Hmm. You could save forty-eight dollars if you ordered our special Sprout Submarine Combo and picked it up yourself. Comes with tofu sticks. Those are very tasty, sir. Good value, too. But I want double meat. Well, I'm sure you can afford the sixty-seven dollars, then. You just bought those tickets to Hawaii. They weren't cheap, eh? Oh. But I see you checked out the budget beach bomb at the library last week. Hmm. Up to you, sir. All right, all right. I'll get the sprout subs. Good choice, sir. Gotta watch that waist if you're hitting the beach, eh? 42 inches. Wow. Man, I'd say tofu and sprouts is, like, required. <sighs> That's how much? Just between you and me, there's a $3 off coupon in this month's Total Men's Fitness magazine. Your wife Betty subscribes to that, right? Anyhow, clip that and it's nineteen ninety nine even. Whoa, looks like you maxed out on all your credit cards. Bring cash, okay? Can a microscopic tag be implanted in a person's body to track his every movement? There's actual discussion about that. You will rule on that, mark my words, before your tenure is over. Can brain scans be used to determine whether a person is inclined toward criminality or violent behavior? You will rule on that. 
I'm now a kindergarten teacher, so I'm, I'll be nice. Um, you don't have to be. <laughs> I, I wanted to ask you, friends of ours that live in France have a medical card, and there is a chip on it that has all of their medical information from birth to whatever age they are. That scared me, frankly, because I said to them, well, how do you want the government knowing all of your business from cradle to grave? I believe our country was founded on independence, and I think we can all agree on this, whether you're Democrat or Republican. I think it's important that we have privacy between our doctor and our health records, and it shouldn't be shared with the government. Uh, Governor Dean. And, and if you could tell me under what moral jurisdiction the Constitution allows you to do that. You, <laughs> the interesting thing about this is one of the biggest problems of, uh, in medicine was just raised in the last question. It's sort of like the psychiatry patient asking the really tough one on their way out the door so nobody can deal with it. This is a huge issue and it's much more than about just this health care bill. The president put in uh, uh, the president put in a lot of um, money in the stimulus package to advance medical records so that if you get sick in some place that's a hundred thousand or a thousand miles from your home um, you can get the, if you have the chip you can carry the records with you they can stick it in a computer they can know all your situations if you can't if you get been in a terrible car accident and you can't tell them anything you have that the doctor has the information they know if you're on some kind of medication etc that's important so what guards are there against the privacy so th there is no really good answer to this because the, in this information age there is our, you, you're gonna, there's going to be, and there already is more information available than any of most of us, at least in my generation, who's not grew, didn't grow up on Facebook, would ever be comfortable in having in other people's hands. Everyone who refused to worship the idol of the beast was put to death. All people were forced to put a mark on their right hand or forehead. Whether they were powerful or weak, rich or poor, free people or slaves, they all had to have this mark. Or else they could not buy or sell anything. This mark stood for the name of the beast and for the number of its name. You need wisdom to understand the number of the beast. But if you are smart enough, you can figure this out. Its number is 666, and it stands for a person. The implant microchip will store data information such as fingerprint, footprint, eye scan, DNA genotype, financial status, and personal history. No one will be able to buy or sell without it. One will identify the individual with the mark. Oh yes, the ID card will also be coded with numbers. And the number is... 600, 3 score, and 6. The hybrid of the two of these products, being Digital Angel and Verichip, is what we call PLD. PLD should be in prototype form by the end of this year, by December of 2002. We have a Florida family who are really pioneers in a brave new world. They have volunteered to be the first ever to have microchip identification devices implanted into their body. After 9-11, I was really concerned um, with the security of my family. In the 1960s, Professor Jose Delgado took a normally hostile bull and implanted electrodes into its brain. Electrodes that could be activated by a radio transmitter. His objective was to see if stimulation of the bull's midbrain could short-circuit the rage signals. 
stopping the bull before it reached the matador. After the bull had recovered from the implantation and in mid-charge, the button was pressed. The bull's aggression ceased instantly. The bull's aggression ceased instantly. A clearer experiment was performed with cats. In this classic example, the hypothalamus, the rhythm maker, was implanted with electrodes. Could it be responsible not just for rhythms, but also for rage? The switch is turned. Then the switch is turned off. Science fiction became reality today. The Food and Drug Administration approved a computer chip that's implanted into people. You've seen it before, right out of Hollywood. It's maybe a little uncomfortable. A microchip inside the body. A hidden high-tech identification tag. Finally from us this evening, technology on the cutting edge. We were interested today to hear that more than 100 law enforcement officials in Mexico are having microchips implanted in their arms. The chips allow a person to be scanned, sort of like a cereal box at the supermarket checkout. Woe to you, O earth and sea. For the devil sends the beast with wrath, because he knows the time is short. Let him who hath understanding reckon the number of the beast, for it is a human number. Its number is 666. microscopic tag being planted in a person's body to track his every movement. There's actual discussion about that. You will rule on that. Mark my words before your tenure is over. a microchip that could one day be implanted under the skin of every single American. Uh, the ultimate goal that these people have in mind is the goal to um, create a one world government run by the banking industry, run by the bankers, where, and, and they're doing it in sections. The, the European currency, the euro, and, and the European constitution is one part of it. Now they're trying to do it in America with the North American Union. Right, and they want to create a new currency called the Amero, right? And uh, the whole the, the whole agenda is to create a one world government where everybody has an, R, R, an RFID chip implanted in them. All money is to be uh, in those chips, right? There'll be no more cash. And this is getting me straight from Rockefeller himself. This is what they want to accomplish. And all money will be in your chips. And so, any so instead of having cash, any time you have money in your in your in your chip, they can take out whatever they want to take out whenever they want to. If they say you owe us this much money in taxes, they just deduct it out of your chip digitally. Total control. Total control. And if you're like me or you, and you're protesting what they're doing, they can just turn off your chip, and you have nothing. You can't buy food. You can't do anything. It's total control of the people. And that chip's connected to a database that has the purchasing records, what you do, what everything. You sell. Everything is in there, you know. And so they, they want a one-world government controlled by them. Everybody being chipped, all your money in those chips, and they control the chips, and they control people. And you become a slave. You become a serf. These people. That's their goal. That's their intentions. I just said, what? What's the point of all this? You have all the money in the world you need. You have all the power you need. What's the point? You know, what's the end goal? And he said the end goal was to get everybody chipped. To control the whole society. To have the, to have the bankers, the, the elite people, you know, the bankers and some governor controlling the world. And, and, and they said, oh, do all the people in the Council on Foreign Relations do this way you do? Said, no, no, no. You know, it, 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 most of them believe they're doing the right thing. Well, I don't believe it's better, it's better off being socialistic. You know, we have to convince people that capitalism 
that socialism is really capitalism. Because America is becoming a socialist country. It's a communist country today. While you were sleeping, everyone in the city was installed code. It was a brilliant idea by Dr. Cocteau that an organically bioengineered microchip be sewn into the skin. Sensors all over the city can zero in on anyone at any time. I can't even conceive a visual of what you police officers did before it was developed. We work for a living. This fascist crap makes me want to puke. What do you think you're scratching, caveman? You really think we'd let you go without control? Your code was implanted the second you thawed. Why didn't you just shove a leash up my ass? Finally, a third angel came and shouted, Here is what will happen if you worship the beast and the idol and have the mark of the beast on your hand or forehead. You will have to drink the wine that God gives to everyone who makes him angry. You will feel his mighty anger and you will be tortured with fire and burning sulfur while the holy angels and the Lamb look on. If you worship the beast and the idol and accept the mark of its name, you will be tortured day and night. The smoke from your torture will go up forever and ever, and you will never be able to rest. God's people must learn to endure. The first angel emptied his bowl on the earth. Once, ugly and painful sores broke out on everyone who had the mark of the beast and worshipped the idol. And because of their painful sores, they cursed the God who rules in heaven. If you have ears, then listen. If you are doomed to be captured, you will be captured. If you are doomed to be killed by a sword, you will be killed by a sword. This means that God's people must learn to endure and be faithful. I saw thrones, and sitting on those thrones were the ones who had been given the right to judge. I also saw the souls of the people who had their heads cut off because they had told about Jesus and preached God's message. They were the same ones who had not worshipped the beast or the idol. And they had refused to let its mark be put in their hands or foreheads. They will come to life and rule with Christ for a thousand years. These people are the first to be raised to life, and they are especially blessed and holy. The second death has no power over them. They will be priests for God and Christ, and will rule with them for a thousand years. Something has to change, though. 
They have to find a better way to identify the bad guys or the rest of us are going to stay home and watch the world go by on televisions. But we need some system for permanently identifying safe people. Most of us are never going to blow anything up, and there's got to be something better than one of these photo IDs, a tattoo somewhere, maybe. The Saudis used an American device to scan the eyes of travelers. I wouldn't mind having something planted permanently in my arm that would identify me. If we don't do something, people are going to stop flying. If they stop flying, and I don't go to the Giants games, it means the bastards have won. And we're not going to let you in, buddy. We saw what you just implied. We're with Al-Qaeda if we don't take the microchip. In medical news tonight, a chip the size of a grain of rice could save your life. Mm -hmm. Now, what happens if you're in a bad accident and can't communicate with emergency workers and doctors? New microchip technology now makes it possible for the emergency room staff to find out about your medical history at the touch of a computer key. Hi, Dr. Hamaka. We're going to uh, check your scan today, okay? Harvard doctor John Halopka says this radio frequency identification chip may solve that problem. He had it implanted in his right upper arm. A scanner reads an identification number. Those 16 digits are then entered into a secure website where his medical history is stored. EMT worker Brian Orsati says the chip could help emergency workers. Vera Chip, subsidiary of publicly traded Applied Digital, has added Tommy Thompson to its board of directors. The company hoping the former Health and Human Services Secretary can help accelerate the use of RFID for health care and security applications. Joining us to discuss the future of RFID and his plans for Verichip, Tommy Thompson, former Health and Human Services Secretary, and Scott Silverman, Chairman and CEO of Applied Digital. D gentlemen, thank you very much for uh, being with us. Well, thank you. Uh, it's an honor to be on your program. M Ms. Thompson, I'll start with you. Um, uh, we're, we're doing a poll today. Would you have one of these things implanted in your arm or, I don't know, under your scalp or wherever you put it? <laughs> you put it in your right arm, and it's very small. And it doesn't uh, bother you at all, but it certainly is going to allow you to identify uh, the, who you are, uh, protect your child. If uh, you have a new child that's born in, the, in a nursery, you can protect that child from having somebody walk off of it. You can also protect your loved ones in a nursing home so that uh, you can put a bracelet on and identify that individual and be able to find that individual if that person wanders away. But I certainly would. how to keep your children safe. We'll tell you tonight. And just around the next high-tech corner, an electronic chip like this that can be implanted under your kid's skin. This is your brain. This is your brain on a microchip. Scientists say they'll now be focusing on linking the microchip with the human brain to see how well it can control artificial limbs and restore brain function. University officials say this is the only Canadian city that will be working with such technology. Crystal Demancing, CBC News, Calvin. Well, President Obama taking on not only health care reform, but another controversial issue, immigration reform. And a key meeting at the White House tomorrow could be the first step toward that reform and for some very big changes for every American worker. Senators Chuck Schumer and Lindsey Graham, bipartisan that is, set to sit down with President Obama tomorrow discussing plans for a national identification card. Now this thing is meant to crack down on illegal workers, but our next guest says it could crack down on you and your privacy. Congressman Ron Paul is a Texas Republican. He's opposed to this card. Congressman, afternoon to you. I would say the problems of every American citizen carrying their papers for wherever they go is a much worse problem than illegal immigration. People over this decades now in, in this country, there have been some who have wanted this national ID card, and they're looking for every opportunity to do it. And this is it. I mean, who knows what will come of it. My guess is they'll probably have a GPS chip in there so that they can measure it. <laughs> everybody every instant no matter where they go so to me it violates the whole principles of privacy the principles of the constitution the principles of the republic and to me as a uh, 
gross distortion of what we should be doing. It's part of an authoritarian society, and uh, dictatorships have this, but not a, 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 a republic. We're okay, but, but tell me how. Tell me how it's invasive, because what, what Schumer and Graham are proposing, uh, according to what I read, is uh, your ID card would have either your fingerprint, your thumbprint on there, or it would have a, a reading of the veins in the back of your hand, and you'd have to be scanned by your prospective employer, and that way, if, you know, if it came up that you weren't legal, they would, they would catch you uh, by, by the scan. Coming up next, how far would you go for better security? How about an ID implanted in your arm? Who's actually asking people to do that? You might be surprised. Also, moving along now to tonight's eye-opener, what would you do if your boss said you had to have a computer ID chip implanted under your skin or you'd be fired? Well, we're not there quite yet, but one Ohio company is doing something that has some people wondering if we're headed down that road. There's my chip right there. So you can actually see it. It's about the size of a grain of rice, and it feels like it too. But what that tiny chip can and can't do has become the source of much concern and confusion. I was in a grocery store, and a couple of ladies said, hey, you're the guy with the chip in your arm, aren't you? You know, run across the scanner so we can see if we get some, a discount on groceries. Sean Darks is the CEO of CityWatcher.com, a small company in Cincinnati that's the first U.S. business to use chip implants in its employees. What you're looking at here is recorded footage back in August of a number of drug deals. City Watcher provides video surveillance for clients and for the police. And the video that it collects, like this drug bust, is the company's biggest asset. And they say they need to keep it under more than just lock and key. You might have one of these where you work, a key card that allows access to different parts of the office. A lot of businesses use them. But here at City Watcher, there's one particular room where you need either the implanted chip in your arm or a keychain. And Sean says the choice is up to the employee. City Watcher employees Chuck Gordon and Kari Williams require access to the secure server room where the video is stored. One got the implant and the other decided not to. He carries the chip in a keychain instead. That's one of the reasons that I don't want to do it. It's just, it's creepy to have, knowing that something is there the entire time. And that's the only time it activates, so other than that, I really have no worries about it. Chip implants have been common in pets for several years, giving the owner peace of mind that their lost animal could be identified. And for retail giant Walmart, the chips are used as smart barcodes to keep track of thousands of products. But for use in people, well, privacy advocates think we shouldn't open that door. The concern is a privacy concern, because when that chip is placed in you, it becomes a permanent form of identification. If it were a bracelet, for example, or an ID card, you might choose not to carry it or not to wear it, but if it's in your skin, you're pretty much stuck with it. It is the case that chips have been hacked. It's possible to duplicate them. It's possible to commit fraud with them. And those are also risks uh, for people who are using this chip. Three out of the five City Watcher employees who need access to the video room have opted to have the chip implanted. The other two carry their chips on a keychain. Like it or not, we're in that brave new world, and it might not be long before your boss is literally getting under your skin. Daniel Seberg, CNN, Cincinnati. More now of our special coverage here tonight, life in the U.S. in 10 years' time. You're rushed to a hospital, unconscious with no ID or medical history, but thanks to a microchip under your skin, it's all there. Science fiction 20 years ago, but a biometric reality today. The technology is based on answering one simple question. Am I who I say I am? Already, fingerprints and iris scans verify passenger identities at airports. Within 10 years, that technology may be even more widespread. And at the Jewel Osco grocery store in Chicago, some customers pay using their fingerprints. No paper or plastic. You don't really need anything other than your hand, and you already got that with you. So will future department stores scan our irises, like in the movie Minority Report, then offer products catered to who we are? Hello, Mr. Yakamoto. Welcome back to the Gap. Experts say that technology is here now. The challenge is to safeguard our privacy in a brave new world. You've probably heard the term RFID chips, radio frequency ID. And they can be used to track almost anything. They put them in clothes to keep people from stealing them. They can also be put in along people so that the 
people, others will know where they are. And now one of the country's largest school districts has started to use this technology with its students. But some parents say putting an RFID chip in their child is an invasion of the children's privacy. Well, it violates, in addition, their religious beliefs. Heather Sells has that story from San Antonio, Texas. Andrea Hernandez's day starts with her backpack, sweatshirt, and student ID. But don't be fooled, this magnet school sophomore isn't using her new RFID badge, she's using last year's card. Hernandez says the new ID violates her religious beliefs. She believes it conditions students to one day accept what the Bible's book of Revelation calls the mark of the beast. Her school requires the card for its activities, like buying lunch and checking out a library book. This is, you know, it's not the great economy of the United States economy. Or the the economy of Texas is the economy of John Jay High School, but you're still not allowed to participate in it unless you have this thing. But Northside says the badges help to keep kids safe. And with 100,000 students in mega schools around the city, that's a tall order. This fall, Northside joined a handful of districts that use what's called radio frequency identification technology, or RFID for short. Northside is piloting the program at its Anson Jones Middle School and John Jay High School. How it works, students must wear badges on lanyards around their necks. The tags contain tiny batteries that emit radio waves. RFID scanners embedded in the ceiling then read the badges and identify a student's location. Like so many schools in America, Jones Middle has surveillance cameras mounted on the ceiling in nearly every hallway. What you won't see here, however, are the RFID scanners that are scanning students' badges. But other parents disagree. I don't like the idea of them chipping the kids. Uh, I believe it does invade our children's privacy and civil liberties and the fact that there is no provision to opt out. It's true. Privacy organizations around the country are backing these parents. You know, the ultimate concern is here that we don't want to turn into a surveillance society. You know, in our, in our culture, in our legal traditions, the government doesn't watch you unless it has particular reason to suspect that you are involved in wrongdoing. This type of technology implicates the freedom of speech, the right to freely associate, religious freedoms. Uh, imagine, for example, a student being dissuaded from attending a political interest group because she fears that the tracking technology will alert the principal or other men members of the school administration where her political affiliations align. But the school district says there's no invasion of privacy and that civil liberty organizations don't get it. We reject their argument. The district has no opt-out policy, which may discourage dissenters from speaking out. District spokesman Pascual Gonzalez says when the program is fully operational later this month, the badges will be mandatory. It will be a requirement of that school for those students to wear their lander and their ID card. If they refuse, then perhaps that's not the school for them. I mean, Northside can throw, you know, whatever they want at me, but uh, in the end it, it doesn't really matter because life is bigger than just Northside, you know, it's bigger than just John Jay High School. But this program is bigger than what Northside is making it out to be. Thanks, Heather. You know, the Bible says that the time will come that there's a worldwide uh, dictatorship and that people can't buy or sell without, quote, the mark of the beast. Well, we have technology now where there can be a uh, tattoo on a hand or on a forehead or on the southern part of the body where the, with the incredible explosion of computer power, we can track virtually the entire population of the world. We can, the, the government can. And uh, it, it's a frightening thing to see Big Brother, if you ever read that George Orwell you know, fictional book, that people can't move, they can't go out of their homes, they can't travel, they can't do anything without Big Brother watching. Well, it just seems like this RFID concept is like the nose of the camel under the tent. It's just coming a little bit at a time and it seems so benign, but the time can come that we will be conditioned to this sort of thing. So.
far be it for me to be an advocate and booster of the ACLU, but on this one, they are right. way the Antichrist will be able to identify those who believe in Jesus Christ as Savior during those final fateful days just before Christ returns to earth. The only ones who will have an adequate reason to reject this number will be those who will not worship the Antichrist. For they will know that receiving it will mean they cannot be saved. God predicts the fate of those who reject the Antichrist number. Most of them will be martyred. John speaks of these martyrs standing before God's throne. And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire. And those who have the victory over the beast, over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. The sea of glass is a symbol of the peace and serenity of these martyrs who have come through the fire of trials and now stand in the Lord's presence in heaven. They have achieved the victory of eternal life with him. Can a microscopic tag be implanted in a person's body to track his every movement? There's actual discussion about that. You will rule on that, mark my words, before your tenure is over. Can brain scans be used to determine whether a person is inclined toward criminality or violent behavior? You will rule on that.
this is really what I mean by a transformation of the relationship between user and device. This person is not a user anymore in any real sense of the English word. They are a subject. A city evolves. Ancient Babylon. Ancient Rome. 18th century London. Urban civilization is evolving. Finally from us today, inside the smart home of the future, which merges a dizzying array of wireless technology to produce something called ubiquitous living. The year is 2017. You rush to a hospital unconscious with no ID or medical history, but thanks to a microchip under your skin, it's all there. Science fiction 20 years ago, but a biometric reality today. Well, here I am at the meat counter. This is what the shop likes to call its intelligent freezer. Why do they think it's so clever? Well, all the packets of meat here contain a microchip. An everywhere world, as Adam Greenfield calls it, is a world in which computers are embedded and merged seamlessly everywhere in the environment. Radio frequency identification tags communicate their position and other information constantly in a vast wireless network. Everyday objects become searchable as if they were part of an interconnected world wide web. In this Internet of Things, scientific management and surveillance of people and the environment we inhabit becomes possible, and marketers' ultimate dreams come true. A road diverges in the desert. Lexus. The road you're on, John Anderton, is the one less traveled. Make sure you are the Good evening. You can move the old fashioned John Anderton. John Anderton! You can use a Guinness right about now. As computer chips become smaller and their processing power increases exponentially, Ubiquitous computing has become a practical reality. As reported by Wired News, ubiquitous systems are to be rolled out in New York City in 2009. The Architectural League of New York will commission five to seven teams to develop urban interventions to be installed in and around New York City in spring 2009 that will imagine alternative trajectories for how various mobile, embedded, networks, and distributed forms of media, information and communication systems might inform the architecture of urban space and or influence our behavior within it. Consumer convenience is a central selling point for ubiquitous computing, particularly smart home applications of this technology. Finally from us today, inside the smart home of the future, which merges a dizzying array of wireless technology to produce something called ubiquitous living, where access to the web is available anywhere, anytime. In Seoul, South Korea, our Joe Hee Cho visited the U Home. Not too far off in the future, perhaps within several years, your home, your kitchen, your living room, your bathroom will be interactive. A screen in your kitchen will show a list of packages that arrived while you were out. Your refrigerator will recognize what you put in it and keep track of how much of it is left. It will even recommend recipes. Today's recommended dish is kalichi. If you're a bad cook, just follow instructions. Boiling the red. The dining room table will know you as well. So this is the art of customized user recognition. The table will basically go up and down depending on my height. In the living room, the TV screen is not only a movie theater, but also a tracking system of where family members are. Take the picture frames and Xboxes away. Everything is integrated into this e-table. From games to children's books, this table can load a good-sized digital library. Choose your interior depending on the day's mood, or just add your TV onto the wall. So the secret lies in this little sticker. This is called an RFID chip. It can be put on me or on my mobile phone and it basically recognizes my preferences. What kind of books I like to read, what kind of music I like to listen to, my whole medical history. This is basically who I am and whether this is a good thing or not, we are at the footsteps of a whole new generation of future lifestyles.
The well-established consumer base for mobile devices was discussed at the March 2008 International Conference on the Internet of Things in Zurich, Switzerland, as serving as a means of acclimating individuals to the presence and use of ubiquitous technology. Possible marketing plans were discussed to introduce self-scanning through the use of mobile devices to scan physical products in a manner similar to internet shopping. Andreas Scheller, a senior engineer for Motorola, presented information to the Zurich conference. The next step is to internetable physical objects, connecting people with things and even things with things. The Internet of Things will enable connectivity not just between people and their computing devices, but between actual, everyday things. By enabling connectivity for virtually any physical object that can potentially offer a message, the Internet of Things will affect every aspect of life and business in ways that used to be the realm of fantasy, or even beyond fantasy. To ensure a fast adoption rate, it is necessary to start with low-hanging fruit technologies like barcode scanning by camera, which will become a free feature for mobile devices morphing into high-end camera phones. So far we've seen examples of the consumer layer of ubiquitous computing, which will likely be its most emphasized aspect. On top of this layer sits the incredible surveillance capability of this technology. Video surveillance cameras are an obvious indicator that you are being watched but the Internet of Things automated surveillance and tracking grid is merged seamlessly and invisibly throughout the entire environment. In the Internet of Things, every object, as well as people who are wearing RFID tagged clothes or are using wireless electronic devices, will be readable by a computer or wireless network. The objects or person's details, exact location, and other information can be obtained electronically by invisible sensors and sidewalks, roads, or always. This convergence of the digital and physical worlds opens a doorway to a whole new kind of surveillance that may give rise to what some call a synchronic society. Dr. Kingsley Dennis, a research associate for the Center for Mobility's Research at Lancaster University, describes a synchronic society in this way. The development of increasingly sentient smart environments will go some way towards creating a more systemic relationship of interconnections and interdependencies between humans, objects, machines, and locality. Here, the emphasis is on an embedded sensory world that will influence and fundamentally alter social practices. Such a cybernomadic landscape has been defined by three primary forces of physical digital fusion, the augmented self, and digitally catalyzed masses. Ultimately, Dennis sees this technology creating a heavily surveilled population inside a global information gridlock that will be nearly impossible to escape. Increasingly, relationships between humans, devices, environments are being merged or steered towards a new construction of social life, one that embeds the individual as a digitally rendered identity within a global information gridlock. If such an irreversible shift is made towards digitally rendered societies, this would arguably lock in a form of monitored controlled society. With such predictions of an increasingly centered and enmeshed global system, it is difficult to see how living off the net will be a choice in the near future. Can a microscopic tag be implanted in a person's body to track his every movement. There's actual discussion about that. You will rule on that, mark my words, before your tenure is over. Can brain scans be used to determine whether a person is inclined toward criminality or violent behavior? You will rule on that. Major computer companies and corporations have foreseen the rising trend of ubiquitous computing for many years. Intel's president, Paul Ardellini, announced recently that the next four decades would be about ubiquitous computing encompassing every aspect of daily life. In a February 2000 document from Hewlett Packard's Internet and Mobile Systems Laboratory, we find that Packard wants to make people, places, and things web present. The document details the infrastructure of the Internet of Things. Our goal is a bridge between the World Wide Web and the physical world we inhabit. It also includes the ability to provide people, places, and things, electronic or otherwise, with a web resource that is used to store information about them and which is automatically correlated with their physical presence. 
And even the citizens of the EU, when they go and ask their own government, their own representative elective government, whose salaries they pay, are you tagging our currency? The answer they get is, well, we, we won't discuss that with you. All right. Um, the plan for RFID ultimately is to use it to replace the barcode. Let, let me tell you why it's important that RFID would replace the barcode. It was introduced in the 1970s, and there was very kind of slow adoption. People were kind of slow in the uptake picking up the, the barcode until one company came along in the 1980s, in fact, 1984, rather prophetically, Walmart which at that time was uh, the 400-pound gorilla as opposed to the 800-pound gorilla it now is, but it was still a big company, Walmart issued a mandate to its suppliers and said, if you want to sell products to us here at Walmart, from henceforward, from this moment on, you will put a barcode on it, or we'll simply stop carrying your products and we'll buy your competitors' products. And I'm sure they'll be happy to put a barcode on there. And almost single-handedly and almost overnight, Walmart drove the adoption of the barcode to the point where now you know, it's hard to find anything that doesn't have a barcode on it. Uh, in fact, even patient wristbands now have barcodes on them, and blood samples in hospitals now have barcodes, and you know, little, little um, ankle bracelets on babies now have barcodes. So we're, we've really kind of gone way to the extreme of using barcodes on lots of things. Well, since I last addressed this audience in this room, Walmart issued a new mandate. And its new mandate is you will verily use RFID. And if you don't, we won't carry your products. So they did that uh, last summer. They told their 100 top suppliers, these are the companies that buy products in every single one of our homes, of that I'm, I'm, I'm virtually certain, unless you live in a tent. Uh, they told those top suppliers that they will begin using RFID on crates and pallets. Uh, if you go through uh, the, the Get Rich Quick Investment schemes, you will see that people are saying RFID is the greatest thing since sliced bread. Invest in this technology and you'll be rich because everybody's signing up for it. Uh, you will see that entire factories and production facilities have been uh, springing up around the world to produce massive numbers of these chips and antenna combinations. Like, I mean, when was the last time you read like a, a logistics supply side journal? I mean, it's just not something that average people hear about. But if you know anybody who works in retail on the logistics or the executive side and you ask them about RFID, they'll immediately say, oh yeah, oh we're on board with that, oh sure. We're not behind the times, we're, we're, we're up with that, yeah. And, um, you know, I mean, we're talking everybody from book publishers to um, consumer product goods manufacturers, clothing manufacturers, food manufacturers across the board. This picture, remember I told you if you put them in the microwave, they burn? They really do burn. <laughs> This is an RFID tag. This is a fairly, fairly good size. It's about this big. And uh, this is after like three seconds in the microwave. This is not 20 minutes. This is literally three seconds. I put it in and I hit five seconds and long before I got there it was like in flames. So um, it, your, your choices if you want to deactivate an RFID tag is you can kind of stand there puzzled waiting for it to do whatever it does, which, you know, this is the only one in the, on the planet, by the way. So you can stand there doing that or you can do this. Um, but there's really not a lot of options for consumers to deactivate RFID tags. So really your only choices are remove it, you could cut the antenna off the chip, you can't really crush it, water doesn't, um, doesn't affect some of these, some of these can go through industrial uh, laundering processes and not be destroyed. So there's really, we don't have a lot of options for killing chips. Well, so the next day, I'm giving a talk in Germany, you know, this, giving a talk to a crowd about this size. And I'm showing these tagged Pantene shampoo and the tagged Gillette products, and everybody's, you know, aghast. We have a little reader device, kind of like this, you know, hooked up to the computer. We've got a PowerPoint, and I'm holding them. And as I hold them one by one, you know, the numbers appear up on the screen. So people are going, yeah, wow, there really is a number in there. Well, on a whim, one of the people uh, up there on the stage with me, part of this privacy group I was working with, said, well, you know, next they're going to be putting these in our loyalty cards, you know, our little frequent shopper cards. And he pulls out the payback card. I love this name. It's the German Metro uh, reward card. It's called the payback card. And he says, yeah, right, next they're going to put it in there. And he holds it up to the reader device, and I will be dipped if a number did not appear on screen. Now, what we found out was they had actually <laughs> hidden an RFID tag and an antenna in people's shopper carts. And they were tracking, tracking people, not just products. And in fact, not only were they tracking people, but they were tracking people from what we could tell as they entered and left the store through those portal devices that they had in the doorway to make sure you weren't stealing the products. They were tagging people right through their wallets, right through their purses. 
and identifying people. Now, we were scandalized. In fact, what you see at the right here is an X-ray, so you can actually see the antenna going around and around on there. And in fact, people were so upset about this that uh, they forced a recall. It turned out 10,000 people had been given this. And when I heard that, I went, okay, well, now I know why, why IBM is calling these people guinea pigs. So they went into just a regular community to the regular community grocery store and, and, and were using it to, to treat people as basically lab rats for their technology. So now the, um, the other thing was uh, another sort of scandal that I uncovered this past year was something called Frontline Expo. And what it is is it's a, a trade show where the people who do the supply side stuff, those reader devices you saw, that's where they sell that. So they do all the barcode inventory control management for the people who have to comply with that Walmart mandate. And it looks like this. Um, it's a sort of medium-sized uh, conference. And you'll see you know, folks there from Philips and IBM and uh, ADT, the, uh, the, the people who do home security and other things. And I'll tell you, I do not know personally of any retailer in the United States that is admitting to openly using RFID. Now, that's actually really good news, because what it means is that if we find it, if you actually find it being done, then that's big news. And in fact, it's big news in sort of a scandalous way that they will have to either explain themselves or back away from it. If you have ears, then listen. If you are doomed to be captured, you will be captured. If you are doomed to be killed by a sword, you will be killed by a sword. This means that God's people must learn to endure be faithful. Everyone who refused to worship the idol of the beast was put to death. All people were forced to put a mark on their right hand or forehead. Whether they were powerful or weak, rich or poor, free people or slaves, they all had to have this mark or else they could not buy or sell anything. This mark stood for the name of the beast and for the number of its name. You need wisdom to understand the number of the beast. But if you are smart enough, you can figure this out. Its number is 666 and it stands for a person. Finally, a third angel came and shouted, Here is what will happen if you worship the beast and the idol and have the mark of the beast on your hand or forehead. You will have to drink the wine that God gives to everyone who makes him angry. You will feel his mighty anger and you will be tortured with fire and burning sulfur while the holy angels and the Lamb look on. If you worship the beast and the idol and accept the mark of its name, you will be tortured day and night. The smoke from your torture will go up forever and ever, and you will never be able to rest. God's people must learn to endure. The first angel emptied his bowl on the earth. Once, ugly and painful sores broke out on everyone who had the mark of the beast and worshipped the idol. And because of their painful sores, they cursed the God who rules in heaven. I saw thrones, and sitting on those thrones, were the ones who had been given the right to judge. I also saw the souls of the people who had their heads cut off because they had told about Jesus and preached God's message. They were the same ones who had not worshipped the beast or the idol. And they had refused to let its mark be put in their hands or foreheads. They will come to life and rule with Christ for a thousand years. These people are the first to be raised to life, and they are especially blessed and holy. The 
second death has no power over them. They will be priests for God and Christ and will rule with them for a thousand years. Yes, God will make his home among his people. He will wipe all tears from their eyes and there will be no more death, suffering, crying or pain. These things of the past are gone forever. I will freely give water from the life-giving fountain to everyone who is thirsty. All who win the victory will be given these blessings. I will be their God, and they will be my people. But I will tell you what will happen to cowards and to everyone who is unfaithful, or dirty-minded, or who murders, or is sexually immoral, or uses witchcraft, or worships idols, or tells lies. They will be thrown into that lake of fire and burning sulfur. This is the second death. 